9242 East 128th? Correct. There's two bodies on the floor, DOA. And there's shells on the bed, blood all over. On May 13th, 2015, 46-year-old Martin Jurum, affectionately known as Marty to his friends and family, was found dead in a pool of blood with his wife Glenna Jurum, 49, wounded beside him. Marty was already cold, but Glenna was clinging to the edge of her life, mumbling fragments of her last moments. At first, it looked like a break-in had gone wrong, but then the investigation took a strange turn when a psychic statement became crucial to the case. Even more surprising was the involvement of a parrot, which played a key role in solving the crime. How did a psychic and a parrot become a part that would reveal secrets so chilling that would haunt the detectives for years to come? Glenn and Jerem was rushed to the hospital where she received immediate medical attention. Meanwhile, detectives had arrived at the crime scene and began their investigation. The initial suspicions were all about a break-in attempt that had gone south. When the neighbors were questioned, they shared their worries about not seeing Glenna and Marty for a few days, which was unusual since they were seen almost every single day. One neighbor mentioned hearing two gunshots, but assumed Marty was out hunting, as he often did. However, when days passed without any sign of the Durhams, the neighbors decided to check on them. The concerned neighbors went to the Durhams' house to conduct their own welfare check. They knocked on the door, but received no response. Growing increasingly worried, they peered through a window, and that's when they made a shocking discovery. Marty and Glenna both lying in a pool of blood. The victims had multiple gunshot wounds. According to the autopsy report, six shots were fired in total, five of which were fatal for Marty, ending him instantly. Glenna, however, was hit by only one shot through the skull. The bullet touched her brain, but not critically, and luckily, after an operation, she began to slowly recover. When she arrived at the hospital, she was then treated by a neurosurgeon and appeared to have at least one gunshot wound to her head. When they said that she was possibly going to die, you know, I felt bad that we had lost Marty, and now we might lose two of them. It was quite horrific. While Glenna was in the hospital, detectives conducted a thorough examination of the crime scene. They noticed several things that surprised and alarmed them. First, the scene did not resemble a usual robbery. Nothing of value was missing from the house, including the couple's wallets and other personal belongings. Even money that was lying in plain sight was left untouched. Additionally, there were no signs of forced entry. The front door was open and the bars on the windows were intact. This suggested that either Marty or Glenna had let the killer in, which meant that they might have known the person. It has to be somebody they know. Can you tell me if their door was kicked in or not? Because if that door wasn't kicked in, they know the person. Okay. They locked that door. They, it doesn't matter if it's the middle of the day, that door's locked. Detectives then considered another possibility. The attack could have been related to the Durham's dealings with the sale of prescription drugs. It quickly became known that Marty and Glenna were involved in selling some prescription drugs. The police hypothesized that during one of these transactions, something might have gone wrong, leading to a conflict and ultimately a shootout. He could make anywhere from $2,000 to $4,000 a bottle. So I warned him a couple of times about that. Because a couple of times they came to their house to pick him up. Whoever it was that he was selling to. I know they're all from the UP. They would drive down here. And I know at one point they were beefing because one of them old gone. To verify this theory, investigators sent all material evidence from the scene for examination, including cartridges and fluids, and the results were quite shocking. At first, the investigators thought the main events happened in the living room because they found blood splashes, streaks, and evidence of at least one shot fired there. However, further examination revealed a different story. Although the living room had signs of violence, the investigation showed that all shots at Marty occurred in the bedroom where his blood and body were found. There was no evidence of his body being dragged from one room to another. Instead, the blood in the living room belonged to Glenna, who had been shot there. The bullet casing found in the living room confirmed this. This led investigators to conclude that the crime scene had most likely been staged to mislead them. Someone had tried to make it look like the incident happened in the living room when, in reality, it took place in the bedroom. There wasn't any chance that Glenna 
with a fatal gunshot wound to her head, could have dragged herself to the bedroom. As Glennon recovered, the police were eager to start questioning her. She was the only witness and could provide crucial information about what had happened. However, they were not expecting what was about to happen. As Glenna started to recover, detectives brought her in for an interview. Despite their hopes for crucial information, all Glenna had to offer was the fact that she didn't remember anything. Her claim of memory loss extended to the entire night of the shootings. Glenna expressed that she missed Marty, stating they were inseparable and she wished she had died too so they could be together. This could be a sign of trauma-induced memory lapses known as blackouts or dissociative states. But beyond the possibility of a memory lapse, Glenna's statement seemed to hold the key to unraveling what truly happened to both Marty and her. Marty's family began to suspect that there was more to the story. His children from his previous relationship, in particular, were determined to uncover the truth, even if it meant bending the law. On May 15, 2015, two days after the shootings, Marty's children broke into the Durham home using a credit card. They believed there could still be crucial evidence inside. During their search, they stumbled upon something that could bring a shocking twist to the case. A manila envelope in which were three letters that were supposed to be written and signed by Glenna. The letters were addressed to her children and her ex-husband. In the letters to her ex-husband, Glenna asked him to take care of the children apologizing for her mistakes and expressing her love for their children and grandchildren. One letter read, I'm so sorry I messed up. Please be there for our two beautiful children and grandkids as you have been. Love, Glenna. The letters to her children were clearly heartfelt apologies. Glenna wrote, I love you so much. Please forgive me. I know I've been a huge disappointment to you all, but I love you with all my heart. You are the best thing I ever did. Love, Mom. These letters appeared to be her last words. Once Marty's children found the letters, they wasted no time handing them over to the authorities. The discovery of these letters immediately raised suspicions about Glenna's deeper involvement in the crime. The investigation took a new turn with the letters. Detectives now had to consider the possibility that Glenna might have orchestrated the shootings in a fit of desperation. To uncover the truth, investigators started digging deeper into the Durham's lives. Marty and Glenna Durham were both in their second marriages, having each been married before. They met later in life, each bringing children from previous relationships into their union. Marty had two sons and a daughter from his previous relationship with Christina Keller, his ex-wife. Glenna had two kids of her own from her ex-husband, Bob Norman. Despite being together for five years before marrying in 2005, their relationship wasn't really an ideal one. Friends and family described them as having a rather chaotic and a kind of love-hate relationship with frequent bickering and fights. Stability was a rarity in their house. Living in a remote corner of Michigan near Sand Lake, their constant fights were almost legendary. Both had foul tempers and mouths, leading to a noisy household filled with yelling and screaming. Some of their difficulties stemmed from Marty's physical problems. Back in 1995, years before their marriage, when Marty was still with his ex-wife Christina, he was involved in a car accident that left him with significant injuries. He'd suffered brain damage on the left side and mobility issues, making him increasingly dependent on others. As his health deteriorated, Marty became more fearful and weak, needing assistance with daily activities. Marty's capabilities were severely limited due to the injuries he sustained, turning his former life upside down. The most painful thing for him was realizing that he could no longer lead the active lifestyle he once enjoyed. Every movement was incredibly difficult and was accompanied by severe pain, which only the most powerful painkillers could alleviate. According to doctors, Marty would have to live with the consequences of the accident for the rest of his life. This situation didn't just affect Marty, his loved ones suffered too. It was especially difficult for his wife, Christina, who had previously focused on household chores and raising their children. Now, she had to find a job and arrange childcare to make ends meet and provide for the family while also having to care for her disabled husband. Fortunately, relatives had stepped in to support her, helping Christina cope with these challenges. However, financial difficulties weren't the only problem. Christina noticed changes in Marty's behavior. He'd become irritable, often snapping at her with aggression and hostility. 
due to his brain injury. Marty also experienced memory problems, forgetting not only long-standing events, but also recent ones. He sometimes couldn't remember the names of his children and viewed longtime friends as strangers. This led Marty to withdraw from others, unable to maintain normal communication due to confusion, memory issues, and lack of concentration. He became alienated and indifferent, spending most of his time alone with his thoughts, which he didn't share with anyone. Despite these challenges, Marty continued his treatment and rehabilitation. He regularly attended physiotherapy and underwent various medical examinations. Over time, his physical condition did improve, though the psychological consequences of his injuries persisted. Christina recalled this difficult period with sadness and pain. She understood how hard it must have been for Marty, who had always been punctual and meticulous, especially with finances. Now, he couldn't even count his own money but still criticized Christina's expenses, adding to the tension in their relationship. The family had gone through tough times. For a while, Christina tried to be understanding, recognizing how difficult things were for Marty. However, her patience eventually ran out, and two years after the accident, she filed for divorce. She later admitted that this decision was out of necessity, as Marty's behavior had become unbearable. This was another blow for Marty, who felt resentment and bitterness over Christina's decision to leave him. We did rehab for over a year and a half before he could really fully walk, talk, eat on his own, and be able to care for himself. She could say he lost a lot of his filter. His humor, his, um, his attitude became really dark. Marty was not the man that I married. I believe I fell out of love with Marty after the accident. I decided to end things and get a divorce. Christina had taken the children and moved out while Marty remained under his parents' supervision. They visited him regularly. Despite the setback, Marty knew he had to move on. He'd received a decent insurance payout, which he invested in real estate, buying a new house in Michigan. Additionally, he received monthly compensation for the accident, which helped him stay afloat and provide for himself. Marty moved into his new house with a parrot from his former family life. Christina loved the bird, but decided to leave it with Marty so he wouldn't be so lonely. The parrot, a 15-year-old African grey named Bud, became a source of joy and moral support for Marty. In his new life, Bud was his only consolation and faithful feathered friend. Marty was determined to regain his strength as soon as possible, get back on his feet, and start living a full life, primarily for the sake of his children. He'd settled in and adapted quickly to his new place. Moreover, he managed to establish a friendly connection with his ex-wife. Christina noted that Marty had an inner strength and a clear goal to recover and return to normal life. In 1997, Marty's first love, Glenna Johnson, reappeared in his life. Recently divorced, Glenna rekindled her acquaintance with Marty and their communication quickly grew into something more. Old feelings flared up and Glenna started visiting Marty more often until she eventually moved in with him. Marty and Glenna enjoyed quiet and peaceful days together, going fishing, hunting, and taking walks. Glenna tried to adapt to Marty's physical limitations so he could participate in these activities, though it was often challenging. They mostly enjoyed leisurely walks around the neighborhood or trips to the local casino, a nod to their carefree youth. From the outside, they seemed like a harmonious and happy couple. Friends and acquaintances believed that Marty and Glenna had finally found each other after years of wandering and were now enjoying their well-deserved happiness. In the summer of 2005, Marty and Glenna decided to officially formalize their relationship. However, some close friends knew that behind the facade of well-being, a different reality lay hidden. By 2010, five years into their marriage, Marty's declining health became intolerable for Glenna. She was appointed as his guardian, a role she hated. Glenna, already struggling with depression and taking medication for it, found herself managing Marty's money, well-being, and household. She openly resented the responsibility, often joking about how difficult it was to care for him and even suggesting that she might end him one day. Despite the challenges, there was a financial upside for Glenna. Marty received $1,100 a month in disability payments, and Glenna earned more than $3,000 a month as his caregiver. However, Glenna had a serious gambling addiction, spending large sums of money in casinos and on lottery tickets. 
they liked the, the casino. That was just one way for them to pass the time and kind of something that they enjoyed. By 2015, 10 years into their marriage, the financial strain reached a breaking point. The couple faced foreclosure on their home, a fact that Marty only discovered when his mother saw the notice in the local newspaper. Confronting Glenna, Marty was met with more lies and reassurances that she'd fix the supposed mistake. Glenna's deceitfulness and gambling addiction had created an unsustainable situation. Despite managing the household budget, she was squandering their money, leading to severe financial trouble. The ingredients for disaster were all present. Dissatisfaction with the marriage, addiction, money worries, and bitterness. In the spring of 2015, Glenna faced the possibility of running out of cash. Foreclosure papers were placed on the door and the news had gone public. Marty, unaware of the financial trouble, was busy with home renovations and had no idea their house was at risk. Glenna's issues went beyond her gambling addiction. As the financial pressure mounted, Glenna's resentment and stress reached a breaking point. Whatever the cause of Glenna Germ's deceit, she continued to lie to Marty, saying that the newspaper article about the foreclosure on their house was a mistake. But it was true. Things were getting worse. The couple had not been making their $700 a month mortgage payments for about a year, and now they owed $48,000. Usually, it takes about a year for a house to go for foreclosure. And it wasn't just the germ's house that had been under threat during that year. On one occasion, a collections agency wanted to repossess one of their cars. Glenna dismissed it to Marty, saying it was a mistake and that she'd get it worked out. But the truth was far darker. Glenna was ignoring their bills and using all their money to gamble. Car payments, mortgage payments, and even IRS back taxes were all being neglected. In their checking account, they had a total of $182. In their savings account, $112. That was pretty much all they had to their names. Glenna was keeping all this a secret from her husband. She ran out of cash to fund her gambling addiction, sinking into dire financial straits. When Marty discovered the truth about the foreclosure, it brought everything out into the open, and that might have been when Glenna snapped. According to the neighbors, on Tuesday, May 12, 2015, the night before their house was due to be sold at an auction, the couple had a heated argument, probably over money. And when the police searched Glenna's cell phone activity, on Wednesday morning, it was discovered that she was quite busy on the web. She used her cell phone to search for information about handguns, specifically the Ruger Single Six Revolver. Shortly after, Glenna texted her mother, saying, Love you, Mom. Sorry. Glenna didn't have to apologize to her mother out of nowhere. There wasn't any particular reason for her to. When confronted with these questions, Glenna had no answers. She couldn't recall anything or relate to any of these. One week after the shooting, the police received a call from Fran Fallon, the wife of one of Marty's cousins and a self-described psychic. While not the typical type of lead the police would follow, Fran insisted she had crucial information. They needed to look under the love seat in the living room. Then, in a twist no one saw coming, an unexpected lead emerged. Officers had already conducted a thorough search of Marty and Glenna's house on 128th Street, finding bullets scattered throughout the house, including the bedroom and the living room sofa. Despite their initial skepticism, they decided to follow Fran's advice and look under the love seat. To their astonishment, they found the murder weapon, a Ruger Single Six revolver. Finding the gun there was shocking. Most suspects either take the weapon away or destroy it. The detectives couldn't shake the unsettling thought that her knowledge of the gun's exact location was too precise to be mere coincidence. This led the police to suspect that Fran might be involved. However, the suspicion quickly faded as she had an alibi and was with her daughter at the time of the murder. With Fran cleared, the focus shifted back to Glenna. The Ruger Single Six matched the gun Glenna had researched on her phone the night of the shootings. When questioned about the searches, Glenna denied making them, claiming she only used her phone for games. Her story again began to fall apart under scrutiny. Despite the placement of the weapon and the wound patterns suggesting Glenna's involvement, there wasn't enough solid evidence to charge her. The police continued questioning her, but she maintained that she remembered nothing.
So, what do you remember about the incident? I don't remember any of that. I just know that I woke up looking for my husband. You may not know what happened. Uh, it, it may not be in your memories anymore. But we have to look closer at this. Uh, that gun was from the safe in your house. In fact, you even looked up on your phone information on a gun that was used. Trying to look up all the information about a gun. And we can't ignore the fact all the stuff that we have. It just has you and Marty in the house. Uh, we didn't find any evidence of someone else being in the house. But I think something went horribly wrong that night. Maybe with a, a fight about finances. Maybe he was going after you about something. I'm thinking you already got me guilty when I want to even hurt him. I'm going to tell him because I love him so much. He's so hard. You don't understand. When approached with the letters found at the crime scene, which matched her handwriting, Glenna admitted the content sounded like something she'd write, but denied remembering them. And everybody else did the same thing. So I don't want you to think that I'm out to get a lot of my job is to investigate crimes and also take care of your health. Um, the tricky part is going to be dealing with your injuries. Um, going forward, you really just don't know. Maybe someday you'll have phone me call and you can come in here and say, you know what, maybe I know exactly what happened. Um, and maybe I'm all right. But at the moment, when you pick all these things in, in the big picture and you put them together, um, you're being an analyst. And the bullet casings from that pistol matching uh, the bullet casings about in the house. Those things together make me think that we have to look closer at this. Um, and there's some other items of evidence that just keep pulling me back, back to whoever was involved with inside that house. Uh, that gun was from the safe in your house. Um, well, if there was no one had access to the safe from your you telling you. So it's limited as to who could get it out of there. Unless Marty had gotten it out for a purpose. Seriously, no. Okay. Was he going to leave that? Been laying around if he was going to do something because everybody else tells me he was very cautious with his gun he was and from what i said if he was going to clean it he would leave it out but not just to walk off and do something else that go outside or something yeah and all, all the uh all the activity looks like you guys were everything was moving along just fine uh, until monday evening and that's where he started to lose contact um, with the two of you uh, as far as the outside world so you know, we wonder Monday night going into Tuesday morning that uh, appears to be when whatever went wrong went wrong. Um, your phone activity dies off. Um, your last text to your mom with I'm sorry. And uh, Marty's phone activity dies off. In fact, you even looked up on your phone information on a gun that was used. Anything that went in there playing games on. That's my favorite thing. I don't go games. Well, I saw that there were some games and things like that, but then early, early morning hours, there was a search of the pistol, the exact model um, that was used. And you know that the gun had to be reloaded at least once. And I also know that's not a very standard gun. And I know that I'm not sure if I can figure out how to unload it without some direction or looking at a book. Um, and again, I, I still think that there may be something here that will explain why you don't have these memories, but I'm just trying to tell you these are the facts of what we have. Um, and we can't ignore facts. I mean, I know that in your heart right here right now, you're dead set and you're positive that this did not happen. Uh, this way that you didn't shoot Marty. But I'm here to tell you that I, I don't believe in talking to the same person that I would talk to that night had I showed up at your house. And that's how this all makes sense to me. Because I can't push the, the evidence aside. I can't I can't make it fit what I want it to fit. I can't I can't investigate that way. Um, I just have to take the facts and see how they fall together. I mean it's it's a puzzle piece really they, they really fit one way. 
we're going to look at all those together and understand how some of them look at this and say, man, maybe she just doesn't look wrong, maybe she's not in the right mind. Investigators had Glenna undergo handwriting analysis, which showed a strong similarity to the letters found at the crime scene. However, even with this evidence, there still wasn't enough to arrest her for Marty's murder. With that, a whole year had passed without any charges. Then, in a twist no one could have anticipated, a shocking new lead emerged from an unexpected witness, one the world had hardly seen before. The case took a bizarre turn involving Marty's pet African gray parrot, Bud. After Marty's murder, Bud was given a new home with Marty's ex-wife, Christina Keller. African gray parrots are known for their remarkable ability to mimic voices, both male and female, and Bud was particularly talented. Soon after moving in with Christina, Bud began to squawk in what sounded like a heated argument between a man and a woman laced with profanity. Christina was astonished to hear Bud repeatedly mimicking what sounded like a fight. Get your moving now! No! Oh, shut up, Tiger! Shut up! I'm gonna find out what you're gonna fuck me! I'm gonna find out! Oh, shut up! Convinced that Bud held the key to her ex husband's murder, Christina recorded the parrot squawking, but initially didn't know what to do with the footage. She just kept it because she figured Bud could hardly be a witness in a murder trial. As the months ticked by, the investigation into Marty's homicide appeared to be going nowhere. Christine thought that she had to get some attention because she didn't think the police were doing enough to solve the murder. After a year, Christina became frustrated and decided to share the video with the parrot. Christina came forward and revealed that she'd recorded this conversation Bud the Parrot had been parroting. In May 2016, a year after Marty's murder, Christina released her recording of Bud the Parrot. It went viral immediately, becoming a huge internet sensation around the world. She believed that because the video went viral and got a lot of international press, it convinced the police to reopen the case and push it forward. Three weeks after Bud's incriminating footage became one of the most viewed videos on the internet, Glennon Durham was in police custody. In June 2016, Glennon was arrested for felony firearms possession and murder. Charged with the murder of her husband, Marty, Glennon's trial began in July 2017 at the 27th Circuit Court in White Cloud, Michigan, located less than a half hour from her home. The prosecution argued that Glenna had planned to kill her husband and then herself, a classic case of murder suicide. During the trial, Glenna seemed unaffected by the presented evidence, even when shown graphic photos of her husband's gunshot wounds. Her lack of reaction hinted at a deeper mental struggle. After a 10-day trial and eight hours of jury deliberation, the verdict was delivered. For that chain of events to happen, she would have had to have murdered her husband in the bedroom, shot herself in the living room, and then somehow managed to make it back into the bedroom to die next to her husband. Glenna Jerome was found guilty of murdering her husband, Marty. In addition to the firearms charge, the murder conviction left only one possible sentence. On August 28, 2017, Glenna was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Marty and I were cousins. He and I were closer to each other than we were our siblings. We both had a passion for the outdoors to get away from everybody, to, uh, I guess, do our own thing. We were both a middle child. She's kind of too old for some things and too young for other things, so you kind of get to be a loner. They gave us something in common. Glenna Jerem will never see the outside world again, a fitting justice for her husband, Marty. Marty's relatives always remember their best memories of him. Marty and I, you know, like any other marriage, we had a lot of ups and downs. Marty liked to fish and hunt more than he liked to work. I'll never forget about that day. He was my oldest friend. We were more than what brothers would be. He ain't picturing life without him now. It's gonna be a lot different. Glenna's family, on the other hand, never expected the case to turn out this way, pointing at Glenna. Most people who looked at this case believe Glenna didn't plan it from the start. She never seemed to think through the big decisions in her life, 
as seen in how she handled her relationship with Marty, her addiction, and their money problems. Maybe she hoped someone would stop her, but that person never came. As the pressures from her gambling addiction, money issues, and Marty's illness became too much, Glenna executed the only plan she could think of. But when she shot him, she likely started to realize the huge consequences ahead. There'd be an investigation. Where would she go? How would she clean up all the messes, both literally and figuratively? It was too much for her. Feeling overwhelmed, she turned the gun on herself. And she might have gotten away with it, if not for the unlikely witness. In the end, it's a reminder that no matter how well someone thinks they've covered their tracks, there's always something that can give them away. What do you think about this case? Do you believe it was Glenna's illness and addiction that led her to do this? Or was it pure evil within her all the time? Do comment your thoughts and stay tuned for more intriguing mysteries. Remember to like, share, and subscribe to Mysterious 7. If you enjoy our content and wish to support us, consider joining our membership plan to gain access to exclusive content. Until next time, stay safe and stay curious.